the mighty name of Jesus, amen. Now, what I, I did do, I got in looking at what I was going to cover tonight, I saw I got overzealous. So I am going to pull back and only get to what I'm going to call understanding. So we're going to understand understanding, understand understanding, at least a little bit of it. And I'm going to pull up some terms. We're going to look at them. We're not going to be able to cover them all today. It's just no way. I saw as I was writing on one of the blackboards that there's no way that I could get through it. So what I'm going now, what I had to also do is, you know, I go to the blackboards and walk through stuff. Well, I don't have enough blackboard space, so I had to erase one of the blackboards, but I made a picture of it so that I can pull it up on the screen to kind of walk us through to what's going to be the third blackboard. So we're going to see two blackboards, a list, then go to the third blackboard. So let me pull this up. I'm just going to quickly walk through these, but I want to make sure y'all are walking in the same direction I'm walking because I'll make reference to these. So the first one, number one, and this is about a thought. This blackboard we've already walked through, but this is about a thought. What is a thought? A thought is information. That's that little purple part. A thought is information that is measured in quantity and quality, but it's only a measure. It's only a measure of information, but it is in quantity and quality, meaning it may be a longer thought, shorter thought, and it may be from God, it may be from the evil one. So therefore, these thoughts are different types of thoughts. These can, we, we have to discern these things. Number two, thought. Thought is a divine ability. We've really spent some time on the mind. That's our next slide. But thinking is a supernatural ability. To think in the dimension where God is, to understand the glory of God, to be able to understand who He is, to receive from Him is supernatural. As I said before, horses and cows are not thinking about the glory of God. But this ability to have thought that's part of the mind. We found out God has a mind. God has this ability. Angels have this ability. And people, because we're created in the image of God, have the ability to think in the realm of God so that we can communicate with Him and we can receive communication. Number three, God gave the ability to be able to communicate. Now, we got to remember God is the invisible, can't be seen with the natural eye, omniscient, all-knowing, omnipotent, all-powerful, omnipresent, everywhere, 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 all the time, God. Now, if you think you can grasp that with your natural capacity, you can't. So this is why when God breathed in the image of God, it was so that he could communicate all of his greatness, his glory, and, and his goodness. But in order to do that, he had to give us a capacity so that we could receive it. And part of that capacity is this awesome mind we have. Number four, thought is a supernatural communication, and it is, and I'm just terming it this, it is the language of the Spirit. It is the language of the Spirit. When you hear from God, you're hearing from the Spirit, and it comes in the form of a thought. Number five, words are not thoughts. They are vehicles that transport thoughts. So when you read a sentence, it gives you a thought. When you read a paragraph, it gives you a thought. And the thought is a carrier also. And as we look at the middle of the slide there, God's thoughts are vehicles also. So words are vehicles of thoughts. God's thoughts are vehicles of truth or himself because he is the truth. And so when God's thoughts are given to us, and we didn't read the verses that we normally read before for the sake of time. But he says, my thoughts are not your thoughts. So God has thoughts. But his thoughts, 
when they're given to us, they become vehicles of imparting truth to us. So number six, thoughts are living and powerful. The word says the word is living and powerful, but the word is carrying the thoughts of God. Number seven, thoughts can join, and this is what we're going to kind of focus on tonight, is understanding what understanding is. Thoughts can join to other thoughts and become strongholds. That's number seven. This is, as I said, kind of what we're going to focus on tonight. No thought you have is ultimately original to you. Our thought life is being fed from external sources. Now we do have the capability of thinking and developing with thoughts, but they come from outside sources. You never naturally had a thought of God. Our thoughts about God are responses to His grace and mercy and Him revealing Himself to us. We did not seek Him first. He sought us. He revealed to us, and then we respond to Him. So none of our thoughts are original to ourselves, but we do have the capability to think. Then the other one is devil's thoughts are also vehicles. And the devil has the capability of speaking thoughts. Now this is going to become part of tonight's lesson too. I've tried to stay focused on God's thoughts primarily but we we just can't avoid having to deal with the devil's thoughts also. But the devil's thoughts are vehicles, but they don't carry the truth, they carry lies. But we have to be aware that both God's thoughts and the devil's thoughts are being peddled in the world in which we live, and they're being peddled in the thought life in the world in which we live. And so this is kind of what we're going to introduce tonight and kind of focus on. So now we're going to go to our next slide. This is the other blackboard that we talked about. Now I'm not going to explain the heart, soul, mind, and strength other than to say this. Heart, soul, mind, and strength are your spirit. Your spirit is heart, it is mind, it is soul, and it is strength. That's what a spirit is. God has a heart. God has a mind. God has a soul. God has strength. We are commanded to love the Lord our God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. This is why Jesus pointed out those four things or repeated it, and it is from the Old Testament scriptures, is because God knew when he breathed the image of God on the inside of us that we had the capability of loving God with our heart, soul, mind, and strength because that is the image of God that was breathed into us. Now we want to walk through these very quickly and then read one slide and go over to the other board. Our minds are designed to receive the thoughts of God. Our minds are designed to conceive the thoughts of God. Think of a woman getting pregnant. You receive, you conceive, Our minds are designed to give birth to the thoughts of God. And then we get into thinking. Number four, up the top left middle. Thinking, we think, we think like God. But we don't think like God because God is the only being whose thoughts are all original to himself. We are working off of given thoughts. God is the only one who has original thought, and he did not receive it from the outside. It came from within him. When we think, we are thinking about what we've received in our thought life, both naturally and spiritually. Then number six, And it's because we have the image of God. Number six, your mind, your mind. Remember, your your heart, soul, mind, and strength are all one unit. But 
There is a distinction between what the different units do, like I've told about your right eye is not your left eye, your left eye is not your right eye, but they both see together. So your mind is the womb of your spirit. In other words, your mind is the receiver of your spirit. That's where, why we have to, and we'll eventually get to, I don't know that we'll get to this verse today, but where it says, take every thought captive. Why? Because our minds are supernatural. They're awesome. We have the ability to think and understand the omniscient God, but we're going to find out someone else has access to our minds also. And so your mind is a womb. And in, in it works like a womb. It's not really a womb, but I'm saying as, as a type, it works like a womb because when it receives, it can conceive and grow something, which the Bible calls strongholds. It can grow something. And so as I put over there at the right side of the thing, gestation, the time from a woman getting pregnant till she delivers, is thinking or meditation your way to obedience, okay? So when we're thinking, we're never thinking alone. Now, that was the two blackboards, and now I've got a new blackboard. I want to read through this slide right here. Okay, so what we're going to do is we're only going to go down to understanding. I may read the others, but the blackboard I've got is filled up with mind, thoughts, heart, and understanding. But your mind is the womb of your spirit. I just said that one. Thoughts from God are called the seed, the word, and they are vehicles of truth. But thoughts come from God. When you read your Bible, you are hearing from the spirit or you're wasting your time. Your Bible sets your attention towards God. God speaks to his people. We're going to see this. We're going to see, we're going to pull up scripture and look at these things. So thoughts from God, they travel via seed. He calls them the seed. We're going to talk about the parable of the sower. And they come in the form of words, but those words are carrying God's thoughts so that he can impregnate, so to speak, us so that we can be conformed to the image of the Son. Now, we were created in the image of God, meaning we have God traits that he gave to us. But he said, those whom I foreknew, I predestined that they would be conformed, meaning we're not there yet, be conformed to the image of the Son. This is a process. Well, how can I be like Jesus? By receiving from God, I was designed to receive and change. As that word Susan taught me, transmutation, that I literally can change because God's thoughts are not just natural thoughts. These are divine supernatural ability to think like God. Now, I don't mean in the sense that we'll ever be at his level. We won't. Okay, so the third thing is your heart. Now, this is pulling back way on earlier lessons, but your mind, as I've said, your mind is the womb of your spirit. It's a receiver, but your heart, though they're mixed together, your heart is where decision to receive or listen. It's where your decision is made. You make decisions in your heart. You, you believe in your heart, but you don't believe in your heart separate from your mind because we know that you think in your heart. So we're going to talk about this, but so we've got your mind, God's thoughts, your heart, and understanding. So that's the fourth one down, understanding Understanding is from God. Understanding helps you conceive. And again, we're going to cover this on the blackboard. It takes two to conceive. The one who gives the seed 
and the one who receives the seed, and then there is a conception. Okay, so we're going to stop right there on this thing. I had hoped to cover all these, but there is no way I'm going to cover all these. So we're going to go now over to the blackboard. Let me pull this back up. Yeah, 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 I got it now. So now I want to walk you through this. So one, a couple of these we've already covered. But in looking at this, what we're wanting to do is we're wanting to understand how this works. And the reason we're wanting to understand how this works is if we get there <laughs> soon enough, we're going to find out that the parable of the sower or the one who gives the seed, the word of God, which carries the thought of God, which is the revelation of himself, we're going to find out that Jesus said, if you do not understand how this works, you won't understand any of the parables. The parables Jesus spoke about the kingdom that's to come. That's what the parables are about. So Jesus is saying, how then can you understand anything if you do not understand the principle of the seed being implanted and growing into what I want. Now, I'm, I'm trying to leave out as much as I can that's not what I consider critical for us to understand. But we have a problem today the way we tell people about walking with God. We have so narrowed down, this is what Tom and I were talking about, we have so narrowed down the gospel to where we tell people if you pray a simple prayer, you're all set. And I'm like, well, then why is the Bible so thick if all we have to do is go around and tell people, pray this simple prayer? And I'm saying we do not understand ourselves, and therefore we are not helping people understand what is God saying, who is he, where are we headed, and what do I need to do? Now, on the day of Pentecost, when they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and each one heard the, the apostles praying or speaking, glorifying God in their own language, they were confused. What is this? Peter stood up and preached and he told them, here's what's happening. It's what Joel said. And then he tells that. And then he tells about them having Jesus crucified. You crucified the Son of God. You crucified the Messiah. And then it says they were cut to the heart and said, what must we do? Now, we're not going into that right now, but I want to tell you this. He didn't say, pray this simple prayer. That's not what he said. And so I'm, I'm saying this to us. We're headed into times to where our faith is going to be challenged. It's already being challenged, but it's really going to be challenged in a strong way. And because we really don't understand what we say we believe, I don't believe we're prepared for what's ahead for us. So this has been part of my motivation. I want to be conformed to the image of the Son. It's God's desire that every believer be conformed to the image of the Son. I never hear anybody talk about that. I mean, they say it, but everybody has this concept that when we finally are there wherever the Lord is at the time that we go, when we're there, it's just going to be a blink of an eye and everybody's going to be conformed to the image of the Son. But that's not what the Bible says. That's just what we've turned it into. So now, that's where I'm coming from on approaching this. I believe we can be conformed to the image of the Son in this life. Now, I don't mean perfect. I don't mean perfect, flawless, without, you know, any kind of mistakes along our journey. I do mean this, that I'm more different a year or a week, a week from now than I am today, that I am changing. I do not see the apostles nor any of the followers of the Lord staying as they were the day he met them or the day they met him. They're not the same. And so there was change. This is something we have to understand that God intends his word to change us. He intends on us not just memorizing facts, 
but we actually receive them as a woman receiving the seed of a man and letting it birth in us the image of the son. This is where we're coming from. So now I'm gonna walk through these. I've put down uh, four primary areas and we're gonna spend most of our time over here. But number one, and I've already said this here at the beginning, but your mind is the womb of your spirit. Your mind is spirit. Now, this is something I taught in a way back lesson, but I wanted to just touch on it for today. Your mind is not your brain. Your brain is a physical organ. I'm not gonna teach this because I have covered this in detail, but when the rich man went to hell, his brain was in his body decaying in a tomb. He had his mind when he talked to Abraham across the great gulf. He remembered his brothers. He remembered Lazarus, the poor guy that was over there with Abraham. He was thirsty. He was conscious of what happened. He asked that Abraham send someone back up to his brothers. He knew where he was. How did he do that if his mind and brain are the same and his brain was decaying in a tomb? because your mind is not your brain. Now your mind is hooked to your brain, which is hooked to the flesh, which is a whole lesson of why the flesh, we have to battle with the flesh because the brain sends signals into your mind also. But a day is coming when we're gonna be removed from this flesh, or if we're here at the coming of the Lord, this flesh is going to be changed in the twinkling of an eye and then our minds are not going to be pulled by our brains, which are hooked to the flesh of the first man, Adam. So there you go. So your mind, we're talking about that part of the image of God. Number two, thought is the language of the spirit. God speaks in thought. Now, this is a whole lesson in itself, and I started to to, speak on this, but I said, no, I've made enough reference to it. But if you do remember, thought is the language of the spirit. This is why when Abraham fell on his face and said in his heart, can a man have a child at this age? I'm past childbearing. And the Lord heard it and responded to it. Why? Because the Lord speaks thought speech. The Lord heard Sarah laugh. And she said, I didn't laugh. And she was meaning I didn't naturally laugh because it says she laughed in her heart, but he heard it. The Lord speaks thought speech. The Lord knew what people were thinking. That is the highest form of communication. It's not mouths and ears. This is the lowest form of communication. Now you and I need this in the natural world and to talk to each other. We need this. But God is saying, I'm wanting you to know that You need to wake up to the ability that God not only hears thought speech, but God speaks thought speech. God speaks in our thought life. And because we have not known this, we don't think God speaks anymore. You know what we actually think? We actually think we're geniuses. We think we get in the Word of God and figure out the omniscient, omnipotent Creator. We think that, boy, I've applied myself and I'm coming to understanding, man, am I smart. But that's not true. Because when I get in the Word of God, I'm setting my attention in the direction towards God. And when you set your attention in the direction of a thought, you then strike up a conversation with the author of that thought. Now, remember that when you're entertaining evil thoughts. You never think alone. And so when we read the Word of God, our attention is being set towards the things of God. And all of a sudden, the Holy Spirit starts speaking to us, and we think we're geniuses. We're not geniuses. We're hearing from God. God is communicating thought speech to us. So we have to wake up to thought speech because much of our life we're making false steps because we're ignoring the thoughts of God. God is speaking within us. You know, the Holy Spirit has been given to us forever. Why forever? We need him forever, both to hear from God, the omniscient, omnipotent creator, and to commune with God. But I'm wanting you to know you can commune with God in your thought life and you do 
Sometimes you wish he wasn't listening, but he's listening. But he's not the only one that's listening. So I want us to go to the next one. Number three, thoughts are vehicles. I've already covered some of this. They're vehicles of truth or thoughts can be vehicles of lies if they come from the evil one. Now, here's what I'm wanting us to see, and this is what I'm, I'm wanting us to wake up to. You remember when Jesus said to Peter, who do men say that I am? And then Peter said, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. Now listen to what Jesus said. Jesus said, you are blessed. Why was he blessed? Because he said, you're the Messiah, the son of the living God? No, that's not what Jesus said. Jesus didn't say, you're blessed because you know who I am. He said, you are blessed because you have heard from God. Flesh and blood did not show you that. Your brain did not figure that out. You did not even hear it from me in the flesh. You did not hear it from the disciples. Flesh and blood did not tell you who I am. I'm telling you, you're blessed. Why? Because you've heard from the omniscient God. You're blessed, Peter. It's not just what you heard. It's that you heard, you perceived. I have received a thought from the omniscient, omnipotent creator because no flesh can reveal who Jesus is. God reveals who Jesus is, the Spirit of God. So this is what I'm wanting us to get a hold of, that this can change our walk with God. I'm not saying in the sense of that we still don't need to do the things we do, you know, living a godly life, helping our neighbor, and those kinds of things. I'm saying this, though, God intended on us being led by the Spirit of God. Jesus said concerning the Holy Spirit, He would speak to us, teach us, lead us, guide us, show us things to come, bring to our remembrance things that Jesus has spoken. All of those are communications from the Holy Spirit. But if we don't realize He speaks thought speech, do we think these are all going to be audible, that he's going to bring to my remembrance audibly, out loud? No way. He's going to, he's going to cause my thought, and, and it'll come back. And he said, Jesus even said, listen, when you're standing before people, uh, being brought before judges and these people to give an account, don't worry about what you say, what you're going to say. Trying to figure it out. See, well, i got to figure out what I'm going to say. He says, no, no. The Spirit of God will bring to you what you need to say. Where, how? In your thought life, in your mind, this incredible supernatural mind God gave us so that we could perceive and receive from the omniscient, omnipotent creator. This is why Jesus said you're blessed, not because he knew who Jesus was, although that's a blessing too, but because Peter had crossed a little barrier there to where he said, I know who this guy is. Well, how do you know, Peter? We think he's him, but how do you know? I know. How do you know? I don't even think Peter could have answered it at that point. But Jesus knew. I'll tell you how you knew. You've heard from the Spirit of the living God. He spoke into your thought life, and you heard it, and you heard correctly. A lot like Jeremiah. When God spoke to Jeremiah, he showed him a vision first. And he said, Jeremiah, what do you see? And Jeremiah said, well, I see a tree and a, a tree about to bloom. He said, you have seen well. Now let me tell you what it means. So see, Peter was walking with Jesus. But then God said, what do you see, Peter? Well, this guy's doing miracles and he's doing this and he's teaching good things and he's a great rabbi. And then God said, you've seen well. But now let me open to you who he is. He is the Messiah, the son of the living God. And Jesus said, Peter, you are blessed. You have heard from the most high. You have heard from the most high. This is the way believers are supposed to be living. So there's that thought. Now we go to number four. 
And I want to talk about the heart some. And we're going <laughs> to, amen. This is why I told you we weren't going to be able to get to all those other things. Number four, your heart is where decisions are made. The I will do this and I will do that. That's made in your heart, okay? But, but I, wanna, I want us to see something here now. So your heart is where decisions are made. I will is a heart decision. But I want us to see something so that we can begin to live a cautious life. Our thought life is incredible. Our minds are incredible. They're supernatural receptors of God. But that's not the only thing they're supernatural receptors of. I want to read some verses to you so that you can now take very seriously your thought life. Your thought life is supernatural. I know people think, oh no, people are just people, they just think. You never, never, never think alone. Thinking is a supernatural happening because it's from the image of God, the mind he gave us. So look at this, John 13, 2. Now I didn't write out all of the verses of these verses, so we, we, you'll have to go look yourself to get the full verse. But John 13, 2, the devil, now listen, the devil already having put in the heart of Judas. The devil has access to someone's heart? Yeah, I got news for you. He's got access to your heart and to my heart. Access, not control, access. Your thought life is incredibly important. This is why Corinthians says, take every thought captive and make it obedient to Christ. Listen, the devil already having put in the heart of Judas. Did Judas, and that was to betray the Lord. Did Judas just say one day, uh, I got an idea. I think I'm going to betray the Lord and make a few bucks of silver on the side. Go buy me a field and hey, that's a good idea. Judas may have thought he thought that up. But the Word of God tells us he didn't think that up. He received that thought from an outside source. And then later, we're not going into that now, but later, and then it says when it came time to actually betray the Lord, it says then Satan entered him. Can Satan just go around jumping in people? No. First, he has to get into their thought life and get them to open the door. And then when they act on that, a decision of their will, when they act on that, then he's like, okay, I got free game here. I have the right to come in. And that's what he did. He entered Judas. So even Judas betraying the Lord, because I thought, my goodness, how could he have had the nerve to do that? But I'll tell you, I had the nerve to do that because he opened the door of his thought life to the evil one. The evil one gained entrance and then the evil one came in and gave him supernatural, unholy help to betray the Messiah, the son of the living God. Now, God knew this was going to happen, but nonetheless, I want us to see how it happened. Now, Psalm 119, 11, your word and then I don't know if these words are big enough for y'all to see there. I hope so. But your word, I have hidden in my heart. So you know what that means? You, you yourself also have input into your heart. You can choose to put something in your heart. You can choose to do it. So he says, your word I have hidden in my heart that I might not sin against you. That's a decision you make to put something in your decision maker, your heart. You decide to put something into your heart so that you will make wise decisions. Okay, so now we know there's two people who have access to your heart. The devil can put something in your heart if you give him place. You can put something in your heart if you're willing to do it. Number three, 
I want us to see this about the heart. Romans 10, 10. With the heart, one believes unto righteousness. See, our heart is where decision is made. Now, we're going to find out. We're not going to get into all this tonight. But we're going to find out that thoughts gain interest. Remember, the mind is the womb, woman's womb. The, the mind is the womb of the spirit. And so thoughts are constantly coming into our mind. But until they make a transition from just being a thought in our mind, which there's a period of time between the time a thought comes and we can cast it down, or a thought comes and we receive it and conceive. So there's some period of time, and the Bible's not clear how long that time is, and it may be longer or shorter according to the type of thought, but at some point a thought comes in, we think about it or meditate upon it, and then we, it, it moves into our heart or we cast it down. A lot of times we cast down God's thoughts because it's, it's so far-fetched to us because we don't know the Word of God. And God may speak to us to go and pray for somebody that would, it would just like require an absolute miracle or something. And, and we hear that and we say, well, that's a crazy thought. And God's like, I'm not crazy. You just don't know. You don't believe. And so I want you to know believing is in the heart. That's when you, you think on it, you meditate on it, and we're going to come to understand understanding, or at least to shave the, <laughs> shave the outside of understanding. And so what we're going to find out is when you meditate upon the thoughts of God, they begin to build. They begin to grow. They begin to connect. And I'm going to show you a little picture here in a second. But they begin to connect, and then they reach a place to where you, you begin to say, I, I believe this. I, I know it sounds irrational that there's an invisible, omniscient, omnipotent creator who created everything, and then we went down the road of sin because of a fallen angel, and then God loves us anyway, and then he sent his son who came down here. We beat him up, we abused him, and then we killed him. And God raised him from the dead, and now he's ascended to the right hand of the Father. That is a bizarre th thing to think. Yet, God is supernaturally imparting to us, and then if we meditate upon these things, we read the word of God, these things start to gel, and, and you say, you know what, I believe that. I believe that. That's a decision made in the heart. It says, with the heart one believes unto righteousness. Not the mind. The mind is how it comes in, and that's where we start processing. But when it reaches the place of our heart, that's when we're willing to do something with it. There's a lot of things believers say they believe, but they won't do. I question whether they really believe it. What they're saying is, I believe the information. I believe the factoids about it. But I don't really believe it enough to do it. Well, then Jesus is saying, then you don't believe. Because if you read the heroes of faith in Hebrews 11, they're all praised not for what they simply confessed, but what they did because they had a confession of faith. They were praised for what they did. That means their heart belief provoked an action. Now I want to hit this this part here and go into understanding and then this is where we'll stop uh, about understanding for today because I, I knew I wasn't going to get to the other. Matthew 13, 19. This is Jesus talking about the parable of the sower, the, the parable that I said that he said, if you do not understand this parable, you will not understand any parables and all of the parables speak about the kingdom that is to come. So that's important information. John the Baptist preached the gospel of the kingdom. Jesus, after John the Baptist died, it says Jesus preached the gospel of the kingdom. We need to have right thinking about the kingdom. And so he says, if you don't understand this parable of the sower, how are you going to understand any parable? So now let's see what this is, Matthew 13, 19. Now, I'm not going into all, the, all of that parable. I'm going to concentrate on one thing because we're wanting to understand understanding. 
What is understanding? We want to understand understanding. Now, he said there was different seed fell on different types of soil and produced different types of things. We're going to focus on one, and this is the seed that fell by the wayside. So Matthew 13, 19, when anyone, now listen, hears the word of the kingdom. So did they hear? The word of God, the quick and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword, dividing asunder soul and spirit, word of God, the sword of the spirit, word of God. Did they hear it? Yes, they heard it. And it says, if you go back and read, it says they, they received it with gladness. Okay, now listen. When anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand the wicked one, Now, remember what I said up here. The devil has access to the heart because he got into Judah's heart. We're going to find out Jesus said the devil has access to the heart. Look at what he says. When anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand, the wicked one comes and snatches away what was sown in his heart. Does the devil have access to your heart? He has access to your heart. This is why, and if you read the, the, I think the Luke version, it says that he comes immediately. So you know what? The things you're hearing right now, guess who's coming when we're done? The evil one. And he's going to try to snatch away. This is why I go to the trouble to try to explain things the best I can. Because if you do not understand what the word of God is saying, It will be taken even from your heart, not your mind. It means your heart means you've already meditated on this some. And you've said, boy, that sounds good. I I think I'm going to live that life. I think I'm going to do that. But, But you really don't understand. And when you don't understand, the evil one comes and snatches what was sown, and it had already moved into your heart. You had made a decision. I'm going to go forward with this. And you and I know if we've been in church any length of time, there's people that come in all zealous and, woo, I got saved last weekend. Woo, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to. And all of a sudden they're gone. Where are they? The evil one came because they did not understand what was, what, what they were getting into. And listen, nobody understands everything we're getting into, but this is also an indictment against us who lead people to the Lord. Tell them, pray a simple prayer, and then go your way, you'll be fine. Not so. The evil one will be on their heels to dislodge everything you told them. So we need to make sure we obey the great commission, go into all the world and make disciples, not converts. Go into all the world and make disciples, teaching them to obey everything I commanded, not go into all the world and get them to pray this simple prayer. Every head bow, every eye closed, pray this simple prayer, you're all set. That's a lie. It's a lie that the evil one knows I am going to come in right behind what they're saying. I won't get them all, but I'll get a lot of them because they don't understand what they're getting into. They don't understand who I am. They don't understand who the Son of God is. They don't understand the omniscient, omnipotent creator. They don't even understand what the Bible is. They are like picking ripe cherries off the tree. I'll get them because they don't understand. So apparently understanding is important to God and also a strength we need to have. So now we want to say, well, what is understanding? Number one is it's a huge subject. We're obviously not going to get to all that tonight. But here's what it, here, we do. We do want to focus on this. Okay. The wicked one, when someone does not understand, they are vulnerable to the wicked one's access to their heart. So as I told you, we never think alone. We never think alone. When you're hearing from God, guess who else is listening? The evil one. And it's because of our flesh that he has access to our brain, which has access to our mind. And so now this does not mean he knows all the hidden secrets. God is able to say secret things and keep things from Satan. But I want you to know this. He does have access to a portion of our thinking. This is why it says he comes immediately. After someone, now listen, for something to move to your heart, you've been chewing on it. 
So he's, he's watching, he's watching, and he's saying, okay, now I'm going to make a move. So what is understanding? What is understanding? All right. Understanding, before we get into it, and I'm just going to do a little quick picture here, and then, and then we'll uh, go to that. But understanding is not just about facts. Okay? It's not just about facts. Many of the thoughts are attached to feelings. If you want to know what's going on in the church today, we're driven by feelings rather than biblical thinking. Yeah, but you don't understand. I love him. Uh, uh, hello? We're driven by feelings. Okay, so now listen. I drew these little orange circles here. These are thoughts. And I put a T in a lot of them and then a red L in some of them. The T stands for truth. Let me get my little marker here. The T stands for truth and the L stands for lie. This is how strongholds are built. Strongholds don't pop up overnight. Strongholds are built. They're built in our thought life. Now, a good stronghold is good. A bad stronghold is bad. Understanding, and this goes into the Greek word, which I can already see we're not going to have time to get. I had two definitions. But the, the Greek word means to pull things together, to put it together, or as we would say, connecting the dots. Understanding is when you begin to put together the thoughts that are coming into your mind. You're, you're getting thoughts, you're processing thoughts, and you begin to put together. Now, let me give you a natural example before I, I talk about the, the truth and the lie here. And, and that is this, you know, they say necessity is the mother of invention. Necessity is the mother of invention. In other words, we got to figure out a way to do this. We got to get something where we can make this, whatever it is you're working on, work. And then you invent something. But why? You set your mind in a direction and you start processing. Well, if I do this, no, that won't work because of this. Remember, you don't think alone. God gives us witty inventions. When you are pressed to figure out something, God will help you provided it's godly. And so we start setting our attention in a direction. We're trying to figure out and we're like, well, I can do, no. Oh, I see it. I see what we can do. There's a way to do this. Okay, that is connecting thoughts. This is what understanding is. You start connecting thoughts. And if you get a big, good, strong bunch of thoughts that are from God together, they're a stronghold. But if you get a big bunch of thoughts that you've brought with you when you came into the kingdom of your old life, those are strongholds, but they're not true. So here's what happens. When we begin to meditate, and that's a word we're going to get into in future lessons we're not going to get to now, but what we're going to find out is when you begin to meditate, trying to figure out, like, what does it mean that Jesus was the Nazarene? What does that mean? And so you start thinking, you start looking through Scripture, and what did I tell you when you set your mind on Scripture? Who comes? You might as well be sitting on a bullhorn saying, Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, talk to me. I'm trying to figure this out. He's like, you got my attention. When you're meditating upon the word of God, you got my attention. I'm the author. I'm the one that gave those words. I can help you. I will lead you and guide you into all truth. Set your attention on these words. Start thinking and meditating on this. Start trying to figure it out. And then the Holy Spirit says, now you see this? That hooks to that. And you're like, oh, yeah. And he says, you see, and that one hooks to that. And that one hooks to that. Oh, I see it, Lord. I see it. It's making so much sense now. This is why understanding, that becomes strong. Those four together are stronger than one. This is what the Bible says. A three-stranded cord, three cord is not easily broken. Listen to me. Four thoughts hooked together that are God's thoughts are strong. They're stronger than one thought, even from God. And so then you start meditating and thinking, this one hooks to that one, to that one, that one, and you're building. God is building. The Holy Spirit is speaking into your thought life and building. But here's what I want you to know. 
What did, what did we find out the evil one here? He comes and he says, yeah, but you know what? Other people used to believe and say the same things you're saying. And you know what? They ended on the dump heap. They ended up, they wasted their life. They didn't even finish as believers. And now you've got to make a decision. Am I going to let that be part of my thinking? If you let a lie into the truth, you know what you have? A lie. Truth and lie don't mix. Part truth and part lie is a lie. Truth is truth. This is why Paul says, take every thought captive. A little leaven leavens the whole lump. One lie, one lie that you think is, well, it's just a little one. But remember what I wrote over here. Understanding the hooking of thoughts is not just about hooking facts together like, oh, Lord, I see how that does that. Oh, yeah, I see that. It's not just hooking facts together, but these thoughts are also attached to feelings. Sometimes it's very difficult for us to cast down a lie because it's something we're familiar with that has good feelings. It, yeah, I know I shouldn't think that. I know I shouldn't include that in my walk with God, but, but that was... That was one of the best times of my life. <laughs> Listen to me. If it's a lie, it's a lie. Don't let it get in your truth. Jesus said this. Listen to what he said. If the light that is in you is darkness, but you think it's light, how great is that darkness? So this is what Jesus is saying. We're warned in the word of God. Check your thoughts, watch your thoughts, meditate upon good things, honest things, things of good report, cast down vain imaginations. Why? Because our, as our thoughts begin to hook together, and I, like I said, I got some lies in here. If this is you, you're going to be in a mess. You know why? Because you got some lies mixed with the truth. Do you know that when the children of Israel, when they made the golden calf, do you know that they did not turn? Now they did, but in, in an overall sense, they did not turn to paganism and say, we're worshiping the God of Egypt. You know what they did? They took a golden calf. Aaron fashioned a golden calf, but they called it Yahweh, the God of Israel. And they said, this is Yahweh who brought us out of Egypt. Well, Yahweh did bring them out of Egypt, but he's not a golden calf. They mixed the golden calf, they mixed the truth and a lie. Was God okay with that and said, well, okay, I'm not really a calf, but they, at least they got my name in on it. That's not what God said. That day, a lot of people died because they mixed truth with a lie. This is what I'm wanting us to understand about our understanding. As we begin to go further through this, we're not only wanting to receive the truth of God and cast down vain imaginations, but we need to go on a manhunt. We need to go through our thought life and we need to say, Holy Spirit, if I'm retaining some thinking that's not you, some thinking that I kind of felt like, well, I don't think it's that bad, but if you think it's bad, convict me, show me, speak to me. Bring it to my mind. If there's something I need to lose, show me. I don't want my thought life. I don't want my understanding perverted. And you know what? This is what we have in the churches today. Homosexuality in the church is a perversion of the truth. Oh, brother, it's just God. God loves people. And if they love each other, I mean, after all, aren't we supposed to love each other? That's a lie mixed in truth. That's a perversion. And the church is overrun with this. And so this is why I'm saying that, and I knew I wouldn't get to the rest of those. We have to now begin to cleanse our hearts and minds. Your heart will be the way you respond and act once your thinking changes. We have to change. We have to do this. We have to rise to the occasion. But part of this, you're not going to do this without the Holy Spirit helping you, showing you, leading you, guiding you. 
So we have to wake up to the Holy Spirit speaking to us and then believe what Jesus said. The Holy Spirit speaks today. He speaks today. Jesus said it. Don't reject his words. Believe what he says and then ask him. Say, Holy Spirit, are there things in my life I need to lose? Are there things I've been believing that are lies? And hopefully not, <laughs> but I just know this. It seems like every time I think I got it together, he's like, now let's go look in this room. And it's like, okay, Lord. But God wants to help us. Listen, he's bringing us into the image of his son. Your thought life has, go has to be upright. And then as you think properly, your heart decisions will be proper. And when they're proper, you'll be on the journey to walking and being conformed to the image of the sun. Okay, we're going to have to stop there. Amen. We'll close there. and we'll, we'll pick up here next week.